Hi, my name's Josh, and today, as part of the Locked Up with a Digico series, I'm going to talk about building a session on a Digico console for an awards show, or perhaps a multiband event. Now, today, I'm lucky enough to be locked up at home with an SD11i. So, before I dig in and start making my session on the console, I thought I'd go through my thought process and pre-planning for putting the session together. So in today's example, I have a pair of SD11i's in mirror mode to give me both engine and power supply redundancy. I've got a pair of SD racks on stage which give me all my inputs and outputs into my system. Then I have an SD mini rack which is uh, going to enable me to get inputs and outputs into the console regardless of which one's the audio master. Then I have an orange box which has a DMI waves card so I can host some plugins. Just my preferred method of uh, doing this. Then I have an OptiCore DD2 which uh, gives me some MADI inputs and outputs for a virtual soundcheck system, so a DAW with a MADI interface. Now, the next step I like to do is just to work out what my requirements are. So in today's scenario I've got three bands um, and the way I like to structure my session for these types of events is to work out the maximum amount of mono and stereo channels I need for each band and take the highest value of each and use that as a pool of resources I can call upon on a snapshot by snapshot basis to uh, facilitate a band. Also you'll see I've allowed some playback channels and that's because quite often on these events we have house playback systems so I'm just going to look at the highest number of channels I need from the playback system for any one band. Now, once I've worked this out, I then need to work out what my other requirements are for the console in terms of input processing. So I've obviously got playback, I've got some radio mics, I've got the band inputs we just worked out. I've got utility items such as shouts, voice of God mic, maybe a laptop for a smart rig. I've got some effects, some reverbs, delays, that kind of thing. Then I need some aux sends to feed into my effects units. And then I've got some groups, which I'll go into in a bit more detail as to how I run my groups. Now, once I've worked this out, I also just need to have a quick think about with the quantity of audio I.O. devices I have on the optical loop, if the optical loop can hand it, handle it. So what I do is I just add up the total uh, quantity based on the cards I've got inserted in the racks and the I.O. devices I've selected. So here we can see between the SD rack, the uh, front house mini rack, the orange box, the DD2. In total, I need 464 channels on the loop, which keeps us 40 channels underneath our limit. So we're all good there. So now we come to set up our session. So today I've got a offline editor in mirror with my console, or it's networked with my console so I can mirror them together. So I'm just going to start on this so it's a bit easier for you to see what I'm doing. So the first thing I like to do is to come in and restructure or build the structure of my session. So I'm going to click default all which will erase any existing data on the console. And as you can see on my list I know what my channel requirements are so I'm going to type those in which is 63 input channels, 6 auxes, 5 mono groups and 7 stereo groups. And then I'm going to uh, obviously leave the matrix inputs, outputs and control groups because they're fixed on this. If I was on one of the larger consoles I'd be able to edit this as well. And then I'm going to give the session title um, Locked Up SD11 and I'm going to restructure. And now I can save this file. So, now we've got the session structure configured on our console, first thing I'd like to do is to uh, look at my audio I.O. So to do that I'm going to jump across onto the actual console. So, uh, I go into the audio I.O. window and there's two ways of adding hardware. If you're building your session offline perhaps or you don't have your I.O. to hand whilst you're or connected whilst you're building the session, you could click add port. So for example, I could add an SD rack onto ID16, like so, and then I could go here into cards and sockets and add the cards in. That's one way of uh, adding hardware. Another method, if you have all the hardware connected, you can click and you're in a single console setup, you can click, sing click single console, and you'll see here 
it detects connected hardware like so. So I've got a DD2 connected today, it's detected that and it's adding it on to the optical loop. Now one thing I'm a real stickler for is for labelling things neatly and uh, keeping my session kind of really well organised. So first thing I'm going to do is just label this connected device. So I'm going to call it ID15 and rec for record. ID15 relates to its ID number. Then I'm going to go to the socket and I'm going to call that rec1 for record channel 1. I'm going to use the touch and turn, turn that up to 64, hit auto rename and now all my inputs are relabeled record 1 through 64. And I'm going to do the same here on the outputs as well. So inputs and outputs are all now labelled. Just to give you an example, I've also done this on all the radio mics as well. So my radio mics here are labelled uh, accordingly, so maybe Shaw RF1 and the cards labelled RF1 through 8. I've done the same here with the playback. So that's labelling and setting up our audio I.O. Next, one thing I like to do is when we do session structure, it does like to... Um, populate all the banks and layers so I just like to go and clear these all out like so so I'm going to jump back across now to the offline editor quickly just so it's a bit easier for you to see what I'm doing now you'll notice I'm going to leave these two layers alone because these are stuff I've got pre-configured in this example we're working on today so next step is to go into the channel list and I like to start um, programming from here. So if I go into input channels, I can label. So if I click edit and click on the input channel tab, I can label my input. So I'm going to call this PB1 for playback one. And I can either tab on the keyboard or click next. And I can work my way through labeling my channels. So obviously here in my example, I've pre-labeled stuff just to speed things up for us. And I've done the same on my auxiliary outputs. I've done the same on my groups and I've done the same on my matrices and I've labelled the only control group that's going to stay the same between all my snapshots. So now one thing I quickly like to do before I do anything else is just set up a few defaults on the console. So I'll go global set defaults and on the input channels I'm going to turn the EQ on and I'm going to turn the uh, groups off so everything's unrooted from groups to start with then on my auxes and my groups I'm going to set my faders to zero just to make sure they're they're turned up ready to go and my matrix outputs I'm also going to do faders to zero and I'm going to turn the mutes on so I know nothing's going to uh, output until I'm ready for it to and then I'm going to close that tab so the next step is to uh, start patching things that are going to be patched uh, in all my snapshots. So some things will uh, the patching will recall in snapshots and some things are global. So for example, my playback is global across the whole session. Uh, one thing I haven't done here, which I'm just going to quickly do, is set my monos and stereos up. Uh, my stereos up. So I'm going to go through and I'm just going to click on stereo here and that makes all of these playback channels stereo and you'll see further down my session where the S is next to the the uh, channel number these are all stereos which means now when I come to patch this so if I go back here onto main input and I have five channels of playback and I select my input card which I've pre-labeled and click on the first one you'll see these are all now patched accordingly and I'm going to do the same with my radio mics. So I have 10 of these. I'm going to go to the playback and RF rack and I'm going to go to RF1, click patch, and there you have it. All my radio mics are patched, ready to go. Another thing I like to do while I'm in here is any groups that are going to stay rooted across all my snapshots. So I know that my playback is going to go to a group called tracks. So I'm going to just root that here. And the time code's not going to go there. Uh, my radio mics are all going to go to a group called Vocal. So I'll just quickly go through and route all these. And once that's done, I can then start building my fader banks. 
So I'm going to close this and to build my fader banks I'm going to jump across onto the console and just leave the editor so you can see what I'm doing. So next thing is fader banks. Now obviously I've cleared out the, uh, the fader banks as a starting point. Now I keep talking or I have mentioned already about this pool of inputs I use. So I've got a selection of mono and stereo inputs. Now my reasoning for doing this is once I start building um, snapshots for the bands, I like to lay it out so that it's as ergonomic as possible. So by that I mean I want to be working on as few banks as possible because I'm mixing one band potentially just for one song. And I need it to be quick. So I'm going to assign my faders. So to start with, I know I have, uh, let's say, eight channels of drums. So I'm going to do eight input channels. I then know that they've got a stereo SPD, so I'll give them a stereo channel, and then I'm going to put my bass DI and bass mic on this bank here. So then I've got a bank which is just my drums and my bass, nice and logical. I'm going to leave, because I'm working on SD11, I'm going to leave, I'm just going to show you here, I'm going to leave this last um, fader empty for now and I'll explain why later. And I'm going to do my next bank. So I'll just come back to the master screen and I've got maybe four guitars. So I'll drop in some mono channels. In fact, I'll just start from 13 there. Then I've got a couple of keyboards and bits. So I'll add in some more stereo channels. Then maybe another couple of brass instruments or a single brass instrument here. So drop another channel in and then I've got a couple of radio mics for some vocals so I can drop two radio mics in there and then I'll put the spare radio mic at the end there so now I can just go and label this quickly so if I go into layout and fader banks I can call this band 1 and I can call this kit and bass and I can call the next one band 1 and I can call this inst for instruments and vox. So now I've got two, two fader banks which have got all the inputs there nicely accessible. Now I do this for every band so potentially I'd end up with two or three banks per band and that just makes mixing nice and quick. So that's my inputs looked at. So next I'm just going to talk through my thought process with my grouping for these shows. So if I come back here and I'll just jump back across to the editor to make this a bit easier for you to see on this screen here. So in terms of groups it's nothing groundbreaking but there's a there's a bit of a thought process to what I do. So for a lot of these television shows um, you potentially have an artist who might go in front of some fill speakers, maybe I've got a center hang and one thing I really don't want to happen whilst we're broadcasting to a large TV audience is for feedback to happen. Um, so what I do like to do is I like to be able to EQ and potentially grab very quickly the level of the vocal to any uh, fill speakers. So I create two mono groups called vocal to fill and vocal to centre. I then have a group for my shout bus which we'll go into shortly. And then, you know, not too different to how other people maybe run their sessions. I have a kick group and a snare group. Um, just so I can merge the, uh, the, in the parts of the drum kit with multiple mics and then maybe do some dynamics and some plugins on those if I wanted to. And then I have a uh, vocal group. So that's to allow me to route the vocal to the uh, fill and centre separately. And then I have a band group which has all the music elements minus the vocals. And then... I have a tracks group and the reason for the tracks group is sometimes you have a, a an artist who performs uh, which is vocal to track only and you may have a very heavily mastered track and by using some analog outboard and um, a dynamic EQ side chain from the vocal it just makes it a bit easier to um, get the vocal to sit in with the tracks a bit better so you know, I use uh, mid-processing on the keyed off the vocal just to tuck some of that vocal range information in the mid-band. Um, 
Currently I do that off board, but with the new quantum processing, that's something we could do with a Chili 6. And then I use some HF compression and add a bit of uh, harmonic distortion just to kind of warm the tracks up and tame some of that high end. Again, with the new mustard processing on the quantum consoles, this could all be done on board. Then I've got a group for my drums and a parallel drum compression group, which is just using the onboard compressor and the onboard tubes just to give me a bit of crunch on my drums. And then I've got a group called Mix to Solo, which we could go into that very briefly now, just how my whole solo setup works. So for this, I will jump back across to the console. So, on these shows, communication is very important. So one thing I need to do is to be able to hear the shout from the stage and from the guys patching in between each act and be able to communicate with them. So I have two groups. I have a group called Mix to Solo. So two reasons for that. The first reason for having this group called Mix to Solo, which I'll just show you here in the channel view, Mix to Solo. Firstly, because I have a band and a vocal group which feed straight into the matrix, I need a way of merging these and hearing them on my solo bus, on my default uh, no solo. So when I don't have something soloed, by default I have a group that can, or an auxiliary that can run to my in-ears, or my headphones in my case out front. Now, Another feature that's really useful on this console is, out front, I have a set of reference speakers which I run from Solo One, which I'll show you how I do that shortly. But generally, if I'm line checking between bands, I'm using my headphones, and that's when I need to be able to hear the communication because I have my headphones on. And the great thing is on this console, Solo Two can also be routed to the headphones. So I also have a mono group called Shout, which has my shout inputs going into it, which means Whatever I'm soloing on Solo 1 doesn't affect what's coming in on Solo 2, so I've always got the shout bus appearing in my headphones. Now another little trick I like to do, which also helps with the um, being able to hear this communication during the show, is to have a uh, ducker on this mix to solo which is keyed off the shout group. So, if I just route my shout quickly to the shout group, which currently has my voice routed to it, you'll see that when I talk, or you should see, when I talk, let's just uh, turn this up, when I talk now, you'll see that it ducks the mixed solo group. So it just gives me a bit of attenuation on my uh, mix coming into my headphones. So that's the mixed solo, and then this mono group here is the group that then feeds into Solo 2. It's also worth noting, just while we're talking about the Solo bus, um, I also have three matrices to feed a left, right and sub, and this just gives me the ability to merge left and right to a mono sub, and also put a bit of a gain offset and a delay offset on my sub, so just for alignment, because I'm using self-powered speakers. So, that's my groups. Also worth mentioning while we're here, um, effects. So I've got six auxiliaries and six stereo returns. And I generally run four off-board reverbs. So these go out via my SD rack, um, SD mini rack at front of house and come back in also via that. Then I use a couple of on-board effects. Now one trick I like to do just to make jumping between screens uh, reduced a bit is I like to insert any onboard effects onto the returning channel. So when I'm working on the send and return and maybe high passing my delay um, and EQing it a little bit, I don't need to jump back like this to the master screen to work on the effect. I can do it all from this window here. So the way I do this, my little trick, which I'm sure there's other ways to approach this, but because I'm using a mono send into a stereo channel, I just double patch it out into a graphic and then I pick that graphic back up here and the graphics just disengaged it's just a, a path for getting that audio back in and that just makes it really simple and means I can work on one layer and that's my effects. So next let's talk about my output matrices so obviously previously I've just shown you that I have 
uh, three matrices here which are fed from my solo bus so solo one comes in here gives me a left right and a sub from the solo bus uh, one thing I didn't just mention was make sure your solo choice on these three is set to solo two just to avoid embarrassment by accidentally soloing and creating a feedback loop um, now my other five matrices on this console I'm using a left right a front fill and a center fill output and then the fifth one is for a smart measurement system. Now, the reason I use matrices is, uh, well, several reasons. Firstly, it gives me a bit of zoning of the, the, the audio system, so separate feed into the, the front fill. So, for example, left and right are fed from vocal and band, front fill and center are fed from band and their respective groups. So, vocal to fill goes to front fill and vocal to center goes to center fill. Um, and we'll touch on well, we've touched on a couple of things, but we'll touch, touch further on that in a moment. Now, I've referenced a couple of times that I like to keep this eight fader clear, and that's just something I do on the ST11. This control group here called PA, on a bigger console, I would have that on where the master fader normally is. Um, on this console, I try and keep it at the end, and this, this exists for a couple of reasons. Now, firstly, I have, uh, hopefully you can see in the top corner there, I have the... Uh, matrices gang so I can turn them up and down although I have the mutes unlinked so if I just show you quickly inside options and gangs I have the delay and trim unlinked and the mutes but I have the gang uh, I have the EQ and uh, faders linked just um, the way I like to do it I like to be able to ID different parts of the PA easily but I want to be able to turn it all up and down as one there now if during rehearsals I want to run the PA a bit quieter, I turn the matrix down and I always try and run this control group at zero. Now, the reason the control group exists is for a couple of reasons. It gives me a single fader that turns the PA down. So on an award show like this, I don't want the um, I don't want to be muting stuff in different places. I want to always mute my uh, console in the same place so when a band has finished I just turn this control group down to minus infinity and I leave everything else unmuted rooted fully so this just stops anything coming out of the PA and that works for, for me for several reasons first reason is um, well if I'm running at a lower level during rehearsals and the show starts and the rooms dried up I can just turn my matrix up by 3 4 dB and then I always know my reference point is this control group goes back to zero and my level reference is always zero here. So if I know that the PA needs to be louder, it's going to want to be louder for the whole show because the room has dried up. Um, but I always want to have a reference point here on this fader while I'm mixing. Other reason for doing it like this is when I'm line checking, um, so on a show like this, there'll be presenters on stage, there'll be awards being presented, but... I'm line checking the next band so behind curtains or off camera somewhere we're setting up the next band so I'll be checking the inputs they'll be getting plugged in on stage so while that's going on I'll be soloing individual inputs as I'm told they're ready and I'll be listening to verify they're they're patched and correct but when I'm not listening to an individual channel I like to be able to hear all the inputs open as the mix would be so especially once the band's plugged up and they're still on stage waiting to go I can hear them talking, I can hear them ready to go, and it just gives me the confidence that when I turn this control group up, the PA is going to unmute and everything's going to come out of it. It's just a bit of a security thing for me. Um, so that's kind of my thought process behind running it like this. So that is my matrices and my groups. So while we're on this subject, it's probably good now to just look at snapshots and why, I, um, why and how I set my snapshots up. So to start with... I would go to the global scope and just look at how I want that configuring. So I want pretty much everything in recall except my matrix because that's running my PA. I don't want that to change for any reason. Also worth noting is to turn the MIDI tick box on because I'm going to MIDI control my external effects. So now I can create a new snapshot which I'm going to call start. And within that snapshot I'm going to go to the recall scope and I'm going to just think about what I want to scope. So to start with, I actually want the bank to recall. So when I, re when I store a snapshot, I want the bank I'm on to recall. And the reason for that is when I go to band one, I want the band one bank to recall, just so I'm not navigating around the desk. It's just a bit of a, 
again a time saver. Another thing I want to recall is control group members because the members of the seven control groups I'm using for mixing the band are going to change band by band so that needs to recall. So now I just need to think about what I want to save out so very importantly that control group running the PA should be saved so let's do that there. Uh, next thing I just want to think about any inputs I need to save. Oh, sorry, input channels here. So, for example, I've got a timecode channel. I want to save that out. I've got the uh, shout coming into my console. I want that to be safe. I've got Voice of God. I've got a laptop. Um, and then I've probably got some groups I want to have a think about saving. So, for example, the vocal to fill and vocal to center. I want to save everything on those except the EQ because I might recall the EQ on a band by band basis depending on if I have any game before feedback issues so th the EQ might be recalled specific to a band but I don't want the fader or the mute or anything to recall I want to just uh, know that, that anything I do to that is global across the session and then I also want to safe out my shout and also my mixed solo so nothing changes from snapshot to snapshot Next thing I'm going to do now I've built my snap or now I've started building my snapshots is on here I create a bank which I call line check with 12 mono channels. So I'm going to duplicate this snapshot and I'm going to call this line check 1 through 12. And then on this channel here, number 1, I'm going to go to the first of my band inputs, I'm going to select 12 here. I'm going to patch those first 12 inputs. Then I'm going to select my gain. I'm going to hold down Option All. And I'm going to turn that up to 25 dB. So when I'm line checking, I've got plenty of gain on there. When I'm just doing a generic line check, either in the warehouse, in the pre-production period before the show. But it just gives me a really quick way of being able to line check those channels. So I'm going to update selected. And I'll fire selected. Now... I probably want to do the same for uh, 13 to 24 onwards, so I'll just do one more just to demonstrate to you. So 13 to 24, and we'll go back to that line check bank here, and we'll just quickly patch that. So I want 12 inputs patching, I want 13 onwards, I'm going to go gain, optional, 25 dB of gain. Go back to my master screen, uh, update selected, fire selected, and if I'll fire the previous. So here you can see 1 through 12 with gain on, now 13 through 24, and I do that for all my inputs. And that just gives me a really quick way now of coming through and line checking through my inputs. So now, having created my line check snapshots, I'm going to create my snapshots for each band. So I'm going to start by duplicating this snapshot, so I'm going to call it band1, like so. Then I'm going to fire that selected snapshot. I'm going to come to my band bank we created earlier. I could start by labelling it. So I'm not going to label all the channels, but just uh, show you the process. So kick in, kick out. And so on and so forth. I would then do my input routing, so I know these first two inputs start on channel 6 for example, and I do my output routing, so for example I know the kick goes to the kick group, and I'd route all my channels to groups, do all my input patch, and do all my labelling. I would also come here uh, to the control groups, and I would uh, assign my channels to the control groups, so I'd put, for example, my drums onto a drum group, perhaps. And I could label that group, I could call it drums, for example. And then I could update that snapshot. So if I go back to the, uh, if I come back here and go back to the previous snapshot, it pulls up the bank I was on when I stored that snapshot. And when I come here, it calls up the snapshot for band one, because I'm in snapshot for band one. And, and that's kind of how I build my snapshots that's a very brief overview but you get the idea so within the snapshot it contains all the patching routing and all the channel parameters 
So after I've built my uh, snapshots, I think about my macros. So let's take a look at that. Now I'm going to talk you through the macros I have, and then I'll show you, uh, show you setting them up. These these aren't all the macros I would usually use, but only having eight buttons here, I just thought I'd show you a selection of the ways they can be utilised. So for example, on here I only have one uh, talk bus, so I want to be able to talk to stage, which would route out an output on stage. So by pressing this button, it turns on the talk, and it also routes this to a socket on a stage rack on the stage which then is connected to the monitor console. Likewise if I want to talk to the shout this one talks the talk, turns the talk on and routes it to a line output. Um, I could show you how these are created and this this kind of process is the same really for any macro. So create new I can capture so first I turn the talk on next I'd come in here and I'd route it, so for example to output one, and that is that macro created. If I come back come back in here, so you can see the macro is created. And I could call this, for example, talk stage. If I insert a comma and I'm on a, a console where the macro buttons have a display, that would start a new line. So I, I still use this even if I'm not on those consoles, because if I transfer the file, then my name's already set up. Uh, and then to create the talk stage off, I'll just do new, capture, turn this off, unroute this, close, close, turn the capture off, and I could turn this, call this talk stage, like so. And there we have the two macros. Now, to assign these, I'd decide if I want them as the on or off action, and I'd click the relevant button. So, for example, this would be the off action here, and if I come in here, the on action would be this one. So we can see the new macro I just created behaves the same as the old macro. And that process of capturing is uh, the same for any macros you, you create. So another example of a really helpful macro I have. Um, I mentioned I have uh, a reference system at front of house. Sometimes I want to be able to turn the delay on and off on this. So this macro you'll see here, turns the delay on and off, but also I've had to put some time on my sub to align it to the um, left and right reference speakers. So I don't want to turn the delay off, I just want to alter it. So this just adds 120 milliseconds on to this uh, matrices here. Another one is um, my mix to the solo bus. I want to just be able to mute and unmute it, and you can see here, this toggles that. Another thing I might want to be able to dim my near field, so this macro attenuates these by 12 dB from their current value. So it turns these down 12 and this down by 9 and then undo it and it puts these back to 0 and this back to plus 3. Um, another thing that I think is really important when you're doing these type of shows where you have any inserts is the ability to very quickly be able to bypass them and perhaps if you're doing off-board compression being able to switch on on-board compression so there's not a huge change in how the um, mix behaves. This macro you'll see just turns my inserts on and off. I'm not sure if you, you can see that there um, but, and it also turns the compressor on. Now another thing I mentioned earlier I have external effects well if something's going wrong and I can hear I have a problem but I can't narrow it down to what specific item it is. Perhaps it's good to just be able to deep to, to bypass all my external outboard. So also this macro here you'll see changes the input patch on my four external effects between being an AS input from my SD mini rack to being an internal reverb. So you can see I set up four internal reverbs to mirror what I'm running externally and this as well as turning my inserts off it changes the patch on here. Then finally I mentioned earlier about having these vocal to fill and uh, vocal to center groups. Another thing I uh, have which I'm just going to make this visible for you in the top corner on the editor is a macro here that when I hit it you'll see it pulls the fader down by 9 dB so it's a very quick I can be mixing the show I can just reach up here and it attenuates by 9 dB if the artist walks in front of the fill speaker with their microphone and the same for the center hang I can just turn it down and turn it back up again so I don't have to go digging around in layers it's just on a macro and it's just a quick grab
So that's it from me. Um, I really hope that's been interesting and helpful. Um, and maybe I've shown you some things you've not seen on the console before or given you some ideas. Uh, thank you for listening and I hope you're staying safe out there and using this time uh, to learn more. I know I sure am and hopefully I'll see you again soon. Thank you.